Hey everybody, Rhino here, the world's strongest ping pong player and inventor of the cooler. The world's only cooler guaranteed to put 100 pounds on your bench press. This is the night version rant about training your metabolism, or maybe more accurately, training your digestive system to utilize more food. There's been a lot of great research put forth in the industry about the importance of eating enough food to fuel muscle growth and to keep your metabolism from slowing down. Much of it has been focused around the detrimental effects of too much calorie restriction and overtraining, leading to what the industry describes as metabolic damage or adrenal fatigue. One of the solutions put forth in the industry is termed reverse dieting, which tempts to prevent the negative rebound effects of extreme dieting by slowly introducing more calories over a period of weeks in an effort to avoid excess fat accumulation and to allow the body's important hormones to normalize, such as thyroid, which may have been suppressed from the diet. Lane Norton does a great job of discussing reverse dieting process, particularly for bikini and figure competitors immediately after competition, so they don't rebound with massive water retention and fat gain. My focus is turning reverse dieting into full-on mass mode for strength athletes, trying to get as big and strong as possible, such as power lifters, strong men, football players, and off-season bodybuilders trying to build mass. I'll also talk about how bodybuilders can use this method to, re to retain significantly more muscle while dieting for competition. The first thing you have to accept is that if you want to get bigger and stronger, you have to eat more food. And the more muscle you gain, the more food you will need to eat to maintain that muscle. Then you'll have to eat even more to gain more muscle, and so on and so on. Eating enough food consistently is the hardest part of gaining more size and strength. The training is the easy part. That's the fun part. It's the eating that causes most people to quit or for their progress to stall. It's exhausting. Brian Shaw has some great videos on Mark Bell's site talking about how hard it is to eat enough food to fuel a 425 pound world's strongest man. I spent an afternoon with Brian on a movie set recently where he carried around a giant gym bag that was full of food and he ate three times in less than five hours. Scott Mendelson was famous for putting down massive amounts of food to reach the kind of body weight necessary for him to bench press over 700 pounds. And Kirill Sarkev and Eric Lillybridge have steadily gotten stronger as they've gotten bigger. I train with 722 pound raw bench presser Eric Spoda, and I've heard him tell dozens and dozens of people who ask him the number one way to increase their bench press, and his answer is always the same, gain weight. The bench goes up and down with body weight. With the one exception of the belly getting in the way of good deadlifting technique, every time a strength athlete gains weight, they get stronger. Now I believe there's a right way and a wrong way to gain weight. Too much fat accumulation can wreak havoc on your health and can become counterproductive for football linemen, strongmen, and other athletes who have physical demands beyond those of a power lifter. And even power lifters that I train, I try to keep their body fat levels within reason so they don't become insulin resistant or experience dangerously high blood pressure levels, which can limit their ability to gain more muscle and to recover from workouts. Now I've been there. In the mid 90s, when I wanted to get huge, I went on a seafood diet. I ate everything I could see. Breakfast was ham and cheese omelets, pancakes, sausage, buttered toast, and whole milk. Lunch was three Big Macs, which added up to over 2,000 calories. I used to drink a giant weight gainer shake with four cups of milk, two scoops of ice cream, a banana, two whole eggs, and a weight gainer powder totaled over 2,500 calories. I would blend the shake up and it would completely fill a large blender. Then I'd proceed to chug the whole thing down as quickly as possible. On more than a few occasions, the combination of such a massive drink, coupled with the fact that it was freezing cold from the ice cream, would cause the whole drink to come back up. Fortunately, an ice cream and vanilla shake coming back up through your nose doesn't taste that bad. Unfortunately, 
since that drink didn't stay down, I had to blend up another and drink it all over again, albeit much more slowly the second time around. Dinner was typically enough spaghetti and meatballs to feed a family of five, and my bedtime snack was a large three meat pizza with extra cheese. I was so focused on simply getting as many calories in as I could that one time I ate an entire family sized bag of Fig Newtons and a half gallon of whole milk. It was damn near 3,000 calories. That's when I found out what eating too much insoluble fiber does to you. I missed two days of work, which I spent in my bathroom pissing out of both ends. While my stomach was so bloated, I thought it was going to explode. I gained a lot of weight on that diet, that's for sure. I got all the way up to almost 300 pounds in 1996. But I looked like a fat sack of shit. And worse yet, I felt absolutely horrible all the time. Unfortunately, that's still how most people in strength sports go about gaining weight. They just eat as much as they can of whatever they can. There is a better way. The nutrition methods I learned from Flex Wheeler back in 2008 are the single most important reason for my success in becoming a pro bodybuilder and a world record powerlifter. Flex believed that you could train your body to efficiently digest and utilize more and more food using a progressive overload method, much the same way we train for strength. If you bench press 300 pounds and you want to add 100 pounds to your bench, you can't go to the gym tomorrow, load 400 pounds on the bar, and ask for a liftoff. The same is true when it comes to calories. If you're eating 3,000 calories a day, you can't just start Ronnie Coleman's 7,000 calorie diet tomorrow. You'll never be able to handle that much food. When lifting weights, your body doesn't know sets and reps, and the amount of weight is all relative. Same with your diet. Whatever amount of food fills you up, that's your max. I'll speak to uh, you know, types of foods later, but for now, let's just focus on calories because maintaining a calorie surplus is the single most important factor in trying to gain weight. The macros are a distant second. That's why, as I get more and more specific about the types of foods I think you should eat to maximize performance, the one overriding principle will continue to be calories first. This is why I always say if, that something is better than nothing when eating to gain mass. Flex had me start my meal plan six months before my show so we could gradually build calories that I could consume. This would later become important for two reasons. Number one, I'd need to be able to efficiently consume and digest enough food every day to fuel the high volume two a day workouts. And number two, we had to have enough calories in the diet so we had room to pull something out if needed without losing muscle. This often happens to bodybuilders and physique and bikini competitors. They start three to four months out of competition, eating too little and doing too much cardio. Then when they stop losing body fat, they have nothing left in their arsenal to continue making progress. How many times have we seen bikini competitors, a month or more out from the show, eating a thousand calories a day and doing two hours of cardio when they can't lose any more body fat? Well, the same is true of heavyweight bodybuilders. Too much calorie restriction in cardio just leads to rapid muscle loss. So here's the details of the diet. We started with the typical five meals a day, four meals with eight ounces of steak or bison, and one meal with chicken breast after training to keep the fats down. Carbs were 100 grams per meal, maybe oats for breakfast, potatoes or white rice for the other meals. The fats were already in the steak, so none were added. And we threw in a serving of vegetables with a couple of the meals. Now that added up to about 4,000 calories, 250 grams of protein, 500 grams of carbs, and 100 grams of fats. Flex told me to call him back when I was hungry. I was easily able to handle that much food. So I ran with it for a week and I called him. And he said, add another meal and call me when you're hungry again. So I added another meal, which filled me up. But within two weeks, I was getting hungry again between meals. I called Flex and he said add two ounces of meat and another 25 grams of carbs to each meal and call me back when you're hungry. So now we're at six meals, 10 ounces of steak each meal except chicken breast post-workout and 125 grams of carbs each day. That's about 6,000 calories including 60 ounces of meat, 
500 grams of protein, 750 grams of carbs, and 120 grams of fat. He said if I had a hard time eating that much food in one sitting, then I could do 8 ounces of meat and 100 grams of carbs, but add a seventh meal. Either way, there's a lot of food. And I wasn't bloated with extra fats and sauces, so I was able to eat it all. Initially it was hard, but the longer I stuck with it, the less full I became, and the sooner I was hungry again. I showed up in San Jose to train with Flex weighing over 270 pounds at 10% body fat. Historically, with my high-fat seafood diet, I would have been closer to 20% body fat and would have had to start cutting calories and doing cardio, and I'd begin to quickly lose weight immediately and end up at 235 pounds on stage. By using the cleaner foods and gradually introducing them, I was much leaner at 270 pounds, and when Flex started me in on the twice-a-day training program, I didn't have to cut any calories at all, and I began hardening up without losing weight. The extra volume, both in terms of training frequency as well as more sets and reps, led to even more muscle growth during contest prep while I was losing body fat on 6,000 calories a day. The only adjustment we made was to have two chicken breast meals, one after each workout, in place of steak, where we believed that the lower fat would speed up the post-workout carb intake. People always assume that I must have been on the shitter all the time for eating that much food, particularly from eating over four pounds of meat a day. But the truth is just the opposite. Since the food I was eating was so bioavailable, and my system got so efficient at digesting the same foods, and my workload was so high, I was burning almost everything I ate with much less waste. After about six weeks of steady progress leaning out, we reduced carbs from 125 grams a meal to 100 grams, and I dieted the rest of the way into the show on 5,500 calories a day, and weighed 255 pounds a week out, and 252 on stage after water depletion. I had only lost 15 pounds in 10 weeks and had the best combination of size and conditioning I ever brought to stage. Immediately after winning my pro card, I drove from San Jose to Sacramento to train with Mark Bell at Super Training Gym, and we only had seven weeks to prepare for a powerlifting meet. I used the same meal plan, except I replaced the chicken with steak, I added back in the extra carbs, along with a tablespoon of butter on the rice and potatoes each meal and I threw in a medium pizza at BJ's three nights a week for extra calories to break up the monotony of the diet. I gained over 35 pounds in a month and got up to nearly 285 pounds training with Mark and ultimately totaled 2,226 pound raw weighing in at 275. We did that in just seven weeks of powerlifting training. In the years that followed, I settled in on some key factors that I feel are critical to successfully training your digestive system to utilize more food. Once again, this is my advice from my experience, having tried many different diets myself and on my athletes over the years. First, I narrowed the protein sources down to one major source per meal and gradually increased the amount of that source over time. Dave Palumbo encouraged me to do this when I hired him to do my off-season bulking program in 2010 when I was preparing for the world's strongest bodybuilder and I was able to get my body weight up to almost 300 pounds again, but at a much lower body fat. When I used to eat too many protein sources at once, such as eggs and cheese and bacon and milk for breakfast, I would get uncomfortably full and bloated, and it would take me longer to get hungry again for my next meal. I believe the multiple protein sources confused and overloaded my digestive system, both slowing it down and preventing it from adapting to more volume. I compare it to CrossFit versus powerlifting. In CrossFit, you become good at a lot of things, whereas in powerlifting, you become great at one thing. I wanted my digestive system to be great at one thing, consuming a lot of very few foods. By specializing, I could train my system to easily digest and utilize over four pounds of steak a day. To avoid nutrient deficiencies, I would include smaller amounts of chicken and a cup of yogurt daily, along with small servings of vegetables and a few different carb sources. But my focus was on driving the steak consumption as high as possible. I felt that the steak, with its high nutrient density and high bioavailability of protein, iron, creatine, 
B vitamins, creatine, potassium, zinc, and magnesium yielded the greatest returns on my digestive investment and gave me the greatest size and strength gains. Here's where people begin asking me all sorts of questions like, what about eggs and is hamburger okay or salmon, etc. Yes, those are all fine, but just like I feel leg extensions have their place in training, I put the bulk of my training investment into squats. Some eggs and chicken and salmon are fine, but the majority of my meals are steak, and that's where I focus more of my progressive overload. As for hamburger, Flex always believed he never knew what went into a commercial burger grinder, the same way ground chicken is full of beaks and buttholes. Flex would buy top sirloin and filet mignon at Butcher and have them grind it for him right there and make it easier for him to cook and chew. At one point when I was training with Flex, my teeth and jaws were getting so sore from chewing so much steak that I substituted fish and chicken breast for a couple days. Flex used to weigh me every day, monitor every set, every rep, and the weights that I used during training, and the rest times for every workout were measured, and he had me pose after each training session. After two days of fish and chicken, Flex pulls me aside and asks me what was going on. He said my weight dropped two pounds in two days and my performance was suffering and I looked flat. Keith and I both looked away because we knew I wasn't eating steak. So Flex asked me again. When I told him my teeth were sore, he told me to suck it up. Use a slow cooker, have a butcher grind my steak, whatever it took, but get back on steak. And when I did, I stopped dropping weight and my performance improved and my muscles were full again. Steak isn't the be-all, end-all, but training your body to consume and utilize massive amounts of meats is the best way to pack on mass and strength. Both Derek Poundstone and Blaine Sumner ate plenty of steak, but they had great success by blending and drinking massive amounts of chicken breasts every day as well. 370-pound Blaine Sumner was drinking 1.3 pounds of blended chicken shake three times a day. I attached his 8,000 calorie diet for you to look at and it's pretty savage. After narrowing down the protein sources and driving the volume up, the second thing I pay attention to is which carbs to eat and how much of each. Certain carbs such as oatmeal, brown rice, pasta, and wheat breads can be hard to digest in large quantities. You may be able to handle a cup here and a cup there, but I found that when trying to eat over 800 grams of carbs a day, that the bulk of those carbs had to come from white rice. Cream of rice, rice cereal, and rice cakes are also easily digested in large quantities and don't bloat you. Not as bad as for, or for as long. So I could eat more rice more often and my stomach became very efficient at digesting. As for vegetables, I know I'm always touting the benefits of meats for athletes, but I also eat vegetables every day. But I'm selective about both the quantity and the type of vegetables that I eat. Vegetables are an important part of a healthy diet. They provide many nutritional benefits. Unfortunately, certain vegetables can also cause gas and other digestive issues like belly bloat and intestinal problems. Too much fiber can stretch the intestinal tract out of the normal range and destroy beneficial bacteria in the gut. Too much fiber can also lead to gas, bloating, and irritable bowel syndrome. Too many high fiber foods and foods high in phytic acid can impede protein absorption and bind to valuable minerals and electrolytes, rendering them useless. I attached a great article titled, Why I Eat White Rice Instead of Brown. It's a good read. One of the biggest culprits for bloating are vegetables and legumes high in raffinose. Beans of all forms are particularly high in certain indigestible carbohydrates known as oligosaccharides. Raffinose is the most prevalent and worst of these. Raffinose cannot be broken down in the small intestine because humans lack the enzymes required to break it down. It passes through your GI tract completely undigested. Once it reaches the large intestine, the bacteria there thrive on it and ferment raffinose into large volumes of hydrogen, methane, and other gases. 
That's why I choose low gas vegetables, such as squash, carrots, zucchini, cucumbers, bell peppers, and spinach. I attached a great article of the top 10 vegetables that cause gas and their low gas alternatives. I've had great success when training women for competition who experience lots of bloating and water retention in their intestines from overconsumption of broccoli, cauliflower, and asparagus. When I substitute low gas vegetables and low phytic acid carbs, their waistlines tighten up immediately and their abs and obliques show more definition. Lastly, I get a lot of questions about prebiotics and probiotics. Let's talk about your gut biome for a bit. And this is largely unsettled science as there is still so much that's unknown about the bacteria that populates the gut. We do know that there is more DNA in the bacteria occupying your gut than there is in the rest of your entire body. Some scientists describe us as essentially just a host for our bacteria. The makeup of the bacteria in our gut can influence our health, both positively and negatively. Much of the research surrounding the gut biome is in an effort to minimize the negative effects of bacteria and maximize the positive effects. It does appear that our food choices can drastically change this gut biome, both positively or negatively, in a very short period of time. And while the industry has been shoving these worthless liquid cleanses down our throat for years, they cleanse absolutely nothing, and the only unintended benefit they have is through the temporary reduction or elimination of the fast foods, processed foods, and sugar-laden desserts that encourage harmful bacteria to thrive. One of the most studied aspects of altering the gut biome is prebiotics and probiotics, and how or if they have any effect on your health. I mentioned in a previous rant that eating certain foods such as yogurt, kefir, or sauerkraut could help with digestion and one of the viewers commented on the lack of convincing scientific evidence, and he's correct. Unfortunately, there is very little definitive research to suggest probiotics and or fermented foods have a measurable effect on digestion or diseases of the gut, with just a few exceptions. Prebiotics have shown no evidence that they benefit digestion or good bacteria. There is some evidence that a select few probiotics can be helpful. Most of the PhDs who specialize in probiotic research agree there is convincing research to support that there are specific probiotics that can help with irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, and antibiotic-induced diarrhea. I've attached an article that talks about these specific probiotics and their benefits. One called Align that helps with irritable bowel syndrome, and one called Floristor that helps with antibiotic-induced diarrhea, which you need to be begin taking after you discontinue the antibiotics, which kill both good and bad bacteria. Randomly megadosing probiotics, however, won't help you digest more food if you're trying to increase calories for strength sports. The main reason for this is that few prebiotics and probiotics Survive the trip to the gut, and every food you eat requires specific enzymes to break down that food, and the bacteria in your gut creates these enzymes as needed. In some cases, our bodies are unable to create the necessary enzymes, either at all or in insufficient quantities to digest some foods or large quantities of those foods, as is the case with lactose intolerance. This is why I believe you have to progressively train the bacteria of the gut to multiply and digest more and more of those food items that return the biggest gains. One last thing before I wrap up. Don't spend all this time training your body to efficiently digest these high value foods, then go hog wild the last day or two before you compete. Bodybuilders and physique competitors, don't eat that bacon double cheeseburger and fries to fill out the night before a show. If you're depleted and you need more fats or carbs, then eat more of the foods your body already knows. If you need more sodium, then add more salt. I can't tell you how many times I've seen competitors do this, and they come backstage and show me their forearms, talking about how good they feel and how vascular they are. Then they take off their shirt, and they look nine months pregnant from the bloating. 
power lifters. Don't get off the scale for your 24 hour weigh in and refeed on a Halloween bucket full of candy and sugar drinks. Just eat a lot more of the foods your body is already prepared to handle. Tons of white rice, salt, and water is the answer. And strongmen, stop showing up to competitions in some foreign country and eating a massive amount of foods you've never had before. Your meals should fly with you or be waiting for you at your hotel unless you want to spend the weekend dehydrated and weak from diarrhea. All of you, stop the insanity. Well, that's my rant. Time to let the vegans and bro science comments commence. And as always, thanks for listening.